you don't like the stock market. No, I'm saying the stock market's at all-time highs. And um, I don't doubt they melted a half million new, or well, half the new millionaires. The question is, will you hang on to that money? Because never in the history of the world has the stock market been this high, floating on debt. And uh, most of the American credit corp, it's on corporate credit right now. And many AAA companies like General Electric are now triple B, one level above junk. So it's, it's floating in all this fake money, as I call it, and yep. that's my concern. So I'm glad people are getting rich, but there's a lot of people, when this market comes down, and it will, will get wiped out. One of your main strategies, and I guess how you've worked out your wealth as well, is by taking risks, and as they say, fortune favors the brave. But you're also really heavily invested in some of the stalwarts, the likes of gold and the like. So tell somebody you know, what some of the strategy could be when you look at a lot of different asset classes, because we know that you've kind of got to have your finger in a few pies. Right. I always recommend to invest in what you love. I love real estate. I love gold and silver. I've started a gold mine, a silver mine, taking them public on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And I just love oil. So I'm only investing in what I love. I love being an entrepreneur. And I really never had a job. <laughs> so I'm just doing what I love. If you love stocks, invest in stocks. If you don't love stocks, invest in something else, you know? But I like gold because gold is God's money. You know, gold and silver have been here since the earth was formed and it'll be here long after we're all gone. So gold will always be here no matter what the markets are doing. So that's why my foundation is gold, the second layer is real estate, and the third level is intellect intellectual property of patents and things like this. Interest, uh, that, sorry, that real my, estate, you like goal. gold. You were saying gold you know, has always been here, it's always gonna be here later. What do you think of some of these new assets that are sort of still being created? So in the cryptocurrency space, the like of Bitcoin, Ethereum. I, I think it's so interesting, you know, I mean, this Bitcoin stuff, they're taking on the Fed. Do you know what I mean? They're mm. taking on one of the most powerful banks ever created. And they're messing into their territory. That's, that's like me taking on McDonald's, you know. <laughs> they, they're going to step on me. So I think I'm here in Singapore. I know Singapore is adopting to crypto or, or uh, what's they call blockchain technology. Mm. So I think it's a very exciting time. editor-in-chief of The Verge. Uh, Nile, first of all, given that we're sort of jumping and changing topics, so just update for us the news that we, that we learned today. Summarize it for us. Uh, so Google is going to partner with Citigroup and a very small lender in its backyard at Stanford to potentially provide the front end to, to checking accounts. There's a report in the Wall Street Journal. They followed up and basically confirmed it. This seems very smart. You're seeing a lot of big tech companies provide these sort of consumer front ends to traditional banking services. Apple obviously has the Apple card with Goldman Sachs. Amazon has looked into to checking accounts as well. I think you're seeing the big tech companies run out of markets and consumer finance is one of the last huge untapped markets for them to go into. And they're partnering with banks because they obviously don't want to bear the regulatory burden that comes with that, that line of work. But sort of what do they get out of it? And what do the banks get out of it by partnering with Google? I think what the banks get out of it by partnering with a company like Google or Apple is uh, building consumer technology is really hard. And you've seen them try. I don't think anybody in the United States loves their banking app. They've all promoted those apps. They've all put them out there. You see competitors like Monzo in the United Kingdom and other countries build really great consumer apps. So if you want to build this stuff, there are only so many engineers, only so many designers, only so many people with uh, the actual expertise to build a best-in-breed consumer product, iterate it over time, and compete against a company like Apple. So it's very clear what the banks get. I think what Google gets here is they get to close the loop of their advertising business with actual consumer spend. They say they're not going to sell the data, but that, I think, is always a red herring with Google. Google isn't in the business of selling data. They're in the business of selling advertising. I think they can it, prove that advertising gets to spend. They're in a good place. It's really interesting that in this recent McKinsey survey, 58% said that they would trust Google with a financial service. 
they beat out Apple and Facebook, but not Amazon. What does it take to earn consumer trust when you're dealing with their money? I think what you're seeing with Google, and Google is a beloved company, they provide a clear utility to people. You ask Google a question, it gives you an answer. It does it reliably, it does it quickly. I think you see that translate into all kinds of other services like that. Other companies, your Apples, your Microsofts, they're in the business of providing a product that you use, a tool, it's sometimes unreliable. So you see with Google, they're in that utility zone, and that builds a lot of trust. You can easily say that when you join City, you really have an open canvas of what you'd like to do. You have the choice of teams, sector, business line. You can either stay in one location or you can move around. And I think it's really the possibilities that you have here that really keep people motivated. What I love about City is how diverse my day is, really dependent on what's happening in the world, what my clients need and where they're coming from and being able to adapt how you do business to meet their needs. City is the bank of the world. Trabajar in City is very exciting because you can create products that resuelven the necesidades of our clients ya sean personas físicas, gobiernos, corporaciones, etc. You get to learn every day. You get to, you know, be involved in situations where you haven't been before, in different geographies, different sectors, with different clients and opportunities. For some of our clients, especially on the corporate side, we operate with them in over 85 countries. City are present in over 100 countries, and we've been in operation for over 200 years. So our relationships with our clients go back multiple years and in multiple geographies. Being a global company, it makes it a little easier to have a holistic view and to try to see where there are other opportunities for us and another opportunity for our clients. La diversidad in City eh, permite que haya ese intercambio cultural. Today we're doing something for a client in Brazil, tomorrow we're doing something for a client in London, and the day after we're doing something for a client in India or China. And so you are constantly needing to, you know, sing from the same hymn book, if you will. We all have one common purpose, and with that, we work together, we collaborate, and we strive for the best. And we are able to utilize this knowledge to actually come up with solutions for the clients. I think we're in a period of tremendous change, whether it's political, economic, or market transformations. We actually have an opportunity. We have the capital, we have the leadership, we have the culture. We're so unique in our footprint globally that I think we provide a real value proposition to clients that no other bank can match. kind intro, Dave. Uh, I'm not the man of the hour, though. These two are. We have uh, the founder of Ripple, Chris Larson, and we have its current CTO, Stefan Thomas. Uh, we're very, very excited to have them. This is going to be an awesome talk. Uh, a little kind of brief intro. Chris uh, got his MBA from Stanford. He started eLoan, which is uh, kind of a mortgage lender. Uh, it was actually the first platform to freely give out FICO credit scores to its users. Uh, he started Prosper, which is actually the first P2P, uh, peer-to-peer lending marketplace in the U.S. Uh, and famously, he co-founded Ripple Labs, which is a subject of today's talk. So we're really excited to have Chris here. Stefan Thomas is the CTO uh, of Ripple Labs. Uh, he was the CTO of uh, numerous tech companies like Elode and TechSpare. He founded uh, We Use Coins, which created this kind of Bitcoin primer video, which amassed 8 million views and was a primer for a lot of people to just learn about kind of the basics of Bitcoin and it kind of blew up on the web, so I'd check that out. Um, and he's a board of directors, uh, uh, he's on the board of directors, sorry, at the JS Foundation, and he's the current CTO of Ripple. Uh, Ripple is, uh, describes itself as the only enterprise solution um, uh, for blockchain. Uh, it allows institutions to send money globally uh, in a fast, frictionless, and cheaper way. 
Uh, and its, its kind of broader uh, eventual aim is to create an, an internet of value, which I'm really excited to talk to both of these guys about. Uh, so without further ado, please uh, give, give a hand for Chris and Stefan. Google may be following Apple's lead and looking to get into the banking sector. According to the Wall Street Journal, Google will soon be offering checking accounts direct to consumers. Yahoo Finance Ethan Wolfman joins us now. Ethan. Wow. How you doing? Wow. That's all I had for you on this one. It's good to be <laughs> here. Just a wow. Yep. I mean, it comes a day after they basically said wow. they're looking at 50 million medical records, yeah. and they're already on Capitol Hill talking to lawmakers about privacy mm -hmm. issues. Does this seem like the right time for Google to be getting into banking? It's definitely an interesting time. <laughs> Oftentimes, there is the back and forth of who does Washington hate more, the big banks, which often they really don't hate at all, or the tech companies. And right now, we've had this big privacy swing and data swing. So this, as you say, is not particularly the best time to get into this. But Google is doing this in a very interesting way. They are going to be partnering with uh, some small banks, like there's a, a credit union out of Stanford, and also Citibank, to kind of power this solution. They don't have a banking license, uh, kind of similar in the way that we've seen Amazon and Chase partner, and Apple and Goldman Sachs partner. This is kind of what we're seeing now. And it's going to be going through the Google uh, Pay platform Mm -hmm. most likely, but really Google is going to take a slightly back seat on this. But it's interesting because we've seen you know, how Gmail slowly crept on mm -hmm. uh, you know, and eventually charged something. We, I wonder whether something like that will be the case for the checking. You know what's interesting here too, uh, PayPal. How is it? You follow this space very closely. Are they hurt? And you have the Apple Card, mm -hmm. the potential Google getting in bed with Citigroup or Citibank. Um, PayPal would seem like a loser here. I mean, this is an, an incredibly competitive environment, especially as all these tech companies are trying to come in and oust some of the banker, uh, banking spaces. Mm -hmm. And obviously, PayPal, um, Square, Square. These, are, these are companies that have been trying to do this for a long time. Uh, and they're companies with you know, maybe less power, uh, I, I think, for kind of the network effect as we've seen from these kind of incumbent players that already have a great reputation for user experience um, with you know, products like, like Gmail and Amazon, obviously, is super easy. So that is something that I think could be potentially disruptive, but it has to be done in the right way. Yeah. Hello, I'm Hannah Wallace, and welcome to Finextra TV. Today we're at Money 2020 Europe and kindly joining me now in the press lounge is Tony McLaughlin from City and we're going to be talking about the future of money. Hello Tony, thank you very much for coming in and speaking with us. So one of the big topics of discussion at this year's Money 2020 is how crypto is becoming uh, back in fashion again. Um, as a result, do you think uh, the future of money is tokenized, would you say? So there are definitely different ways of building a monetary system. Uh, the type of monetary system that we live in at the moment is the fiat currency system and that's built on central bank money as the base layer, commercial bank money and e-money. But there's a different way of doing it. You could have uh, central bank digital currencies, stable coins, public cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And these are two very, very different ways of building uh, a, a kind of monetary system. And the question is, which is going to work better for the needs of economic actors in the 21st century? All right. Fantastic. Well, following on from that quite nicely then, we've seen some fantastic examples of fintech innovation. Do you think there's sort of a global narrative for what we're seeing in the market? I think you can connect the dots between what's happening in China, India, the development of wallets which are really reaching mass market, but also the development of faster payment systems in many different countries. And so the way I look at it is this. Um, in the 21st century, commerce has become 24 by 7, real time and interactive. But the banking system isn't. The banking system is built on batch processing, store and forward messaging, and really kind of clockwork end of day systems. And the fintech community is building a bridge between the 20th century banking system and 21st century commerce. So what I see really happening is the revival of the underlying rails and both the cleaning systems and the banks needing to move with e-commerce into the 21st century and becoming 24 by 7 and 365. This is trying to illustrate is um, if you deploy Interledger on some network and we envision that there will probably be sort of a global instance of it, just like the internet um, has a global instance. 
um, then you have these different nodes, um, these, these little blue nodes here. Whenever you look at any kind of blockchain presentation, there's a pretty good chance you'll see some kind of graphic that has you know, nodes connected by lines, um, some kind of graph. And uh, you know, you'll hear things like Bitcoin is the TCP IP of money. And when we hear that, we cringe a little bit because if you know anything about how TCP IP works and how Bitcoin works, they are very different protocols that do very different things in a very different way. Um, and so the challenge that we always have when we talk about Interledger is it is actually a lot like TCP IP. And, and through this little presentation, I want to try to convince you as to why I say that. Um, but of course, the majority of, of people, users out there, don't actually have easy access to digital assets yet. Um, and so you do need some kind of uh, some form of uh, support for traditional payment systems. And the interesting thing is that all these settlement networks really do is you know move payments uh, across or like move money. And so um, that's something that is supported by all the legacy payment networks. So we, what we can actually do is we can just aggregate to a greater degree. So we wait a little bit longer before we settle. Um, and then we send a one big payment across. So you see that kind of at the beginning here with the sender uh, down there and the receiver in the upper right, um, where those, pa those settlements are happening a little less frequently and they're a little bit bigger and they're probably a little bit more expensive, but they can settle lots and lots of these individual packets. Um, and so with this architecture, what that means is that from an end-to-end -end perspective, we can send a packet at incredibly low latency, um, we can send it um, at an incredibly low incremental cost, and so that's really what makes it feel a lot like the internet. You can really just um, connect to lots of different services and pay for lots of different things without accumulating a lot of fees while doing that. And then, sure, there's a settlement eventually, and you know, hopefully these uh, last mile sort of settlements will get more efficient, just like internet connectivity went from you know 56k modems uh, all the way up to what we have now, where I have uh, Google Fiber, so I'm very happy with that. <laughs> As you explore and interact with the network, growth opportunities for your company get surfaced. To improve your capabilities in an existing corridor or expand into a new one. And watch as your network and your reach continue to grow. Hello, I'm Asif Farouk of Finextra, and we're here at Cybos 2014 in Boston, and I'm with Chris Larson of Ripple. So Chris, thank you for joining us firstly. Thanks so much for having us. You're welcome. Um, so recently in the news, we've heard about Ripple signing two US banks, um, which is, I guess, great news for you. And I'd like to know the process behind that happening. How did that all come about? Yeah, so we, yeah, we just uh, announced that we signed up uh, CBW out of Kansas and Cross River Bank out of New Jersey. And uh, obviously with banks, you know, banks are uh, rightly uh, careful about any new technology for regulatory purposes yeah. and, and for stability purposes. So, you know, these conversations do take a while, six months to a year, we think, to really sort of introduce the concept and then how can it be applied and then start talking about pilots. Um, but we're really pleased. These are the first U.S. banks now on the Ripple protocol. So we think we are starting to get our message out there that uh, these new technologies, distributed ledgers, really can be seen as alternatives, really viable, viable alternatives to correspondent banking. And that's very powerful for um, particularly smaller banks that otherwise have to rely on correspondent banks. Okay. So I'm, am I right in thinking the strategy is then to get a, kind of a nationwide deployment of Ripple? And if so, how, how is that going to work? What's the strategy? Yeah, so the strategy really is now first uh, try to get a bank in each of the key regions of the world. Because if you can connect one bank on ACH in the US to one bank uh, on SEPA in Europe, you have effectively connected all of the banks on those two networks. So you really get a multiplier effect. Now we have this Fedor out of Germany on SIPA, and we have now these two US banks on, on ACH. Now we gotta work on China, we gotta work in you know, South America, you know, India, uh, and really continue to, to spread it and get to some of the bank networks. So definitely getting banks as gateways to bring currencies onto the platform is very important. And then along with that, bringing market makers to make markets between those currencies, cross currencies.
continue to, to spread it and get to some of the bank networks. So definitely getting banks as gateways to bring currencies onto the platform is very important. And then along with that, bringing market makers to make markets between those currencies, cross currencies. We've, we've already been pretty successful there. We have about seven institutional market makers already. Now, now it's really kind of filling it up with banks. Google wants to be your everything. What started out as your preferred search engine has now transformed over the last two decades to become a tech conglomerate, which is now reaching into your health, your home, and next, your finances? Yeah, Google is now looking into banking, and that may arrive as early as next year. Here to discuss, investigative journalist Ben Swan. Uh, okay. I, I thought, by the way, I thought you were going to say Google wants to be your Huckleberry. That's, well, that's, what I thought that's, that's how that's I thought you were going to start this. They do, Ben. Yeah. They, they want to be your everything. They're, yeah. you know, they're going to be your AI love next. That's right. You never know. I've seen the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so on this note here, Google banking, Ben, uh, this will be in conjunction yes. with Citigroup and Stanford Federal Credit Union, which I've never heard of. Right. Uh, so break all this down for us. Yeah, so essentially what Google wants to do is create checking accounts, and they want to be able to sign up their tens of millions of users into these checking accounts. But the problem is, of course, that you can't just start a bank uh, in the United <laughs> yeah. States. There's a lot of regulatory issues there, as Facebook is learning with their Libra project. And so what they've done is partnered with other banking facilities uh, and institutions, and what Google is essentially saying is, is that they're going to facilitate those checking accounts. They're going to kind of work it into their Google Pay system, probably even at some point offer credit cards the way that Apple has. Yeah. But they won't actually be the financial institution. Those other existing banks like Citibank or this Federal Credit Union and others to follow would actually be the um, FDIC or mm. NCUA insured entities that meet all the financial and banking regulations. That way Google doesn't have to mess with that. Oh, okay, so you're saying my my Google smart car is not going to be tied to my Google bank account, which I got the Google loan from. No, it, it absolutely will be. Maybe but it will day. also it will also tie in those other banking institutions so that so that federal regulators don't say you guys can't do this, you're not a bank. Right, right, because yeah. you're not professionals at this, so let right. Citigroup do it. That's right. Okay, so Google says they're they're getting into banking is just you know trying to make banking easier and more mm -hmm. streamlined for this new generation of users. You know, not the dinosaurs like us that you know you know, want to go in and go talk to a person. Go one place here and one place here. Right, like put money here and put money. They, they want to streamline all of this. Sure. It, it'll go all into an online platform is what they're anticipating, um, that you know their tech will make all of our lives easier. The key thing to mention here is that all we need from the settlement layer is that it can transmit money. It doesn't have to be very fast, it doesn't have to be very cheap. Um, if it's slower, we just settle less often. Um, and just to give you some examples of the kinds of things we've integrated with already, um, there's a XRP PayChain plugin, so that's settling using the XRP ledger. That's the most efficient plugin right now. Um, that's one of the reasons that we feel good about the strategy. It's like we're actually seeing in practice that our own products score really well on these different uh, metrics. Um, in terms of like what ledger would you actually choose for settlement. Um, we've done a lightning integration, so we did a little test where we actually connected the Bitcoin lightning network and the Litecoin lightning network together. If you're not familiar with lightning, it's basically a scalability overlay network for uh, currencies like Bitcoin. Um, and then you could do something like ACH, you can even do cash if you want, right? So you can have a relationship with an interledger service provider where it basically says like, I give you cash ahead of time or you give me cash ahead of time and then we can exchange packets up to that amount um, until we reach that balance and then you know, we have to settle up again. In Asia Pacific today, customers check their smartphone 150 times a day. 70% of our own Citibank customers check their email on their phone. It is clear that for us as city, mobile banking is a significant channel. Many of us carry our mobile phones with us everywhere. The mobile represents the best opportunity to extend the reach of our services and ultimately to transform the way in which our customers do banking with us. Our priority for mobile banking comes down to one thing, and that is convenience. Giving our customers access to banking wherever they are and whenever they choose to, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's like having a bank branch in your hand, one that is with you wherever you go and is available always.
We've developed a range of market-first mobile solutions for customers. For example, in India, we've launched a solution called Tap and Go, which enables customers to conveniently and quickly pay by simply tapping a phone instead of swiping credit cards at points of sale. And since the majority of local business searches are actually happening on mobile today, we've introduced a range of location-based services, such as shopping, dining, and travel credit card offers, as well as ATM and branch locators. None of the progress we made on mobile banking would have been possible if we didn't tackle mobile banking from the inside out. The first thing we had to do is look at organizational change. To do this, we established a team of 30 people that was centralized and dedicated exclusively on mobile banking. This included new talent with a unique skill set to understand the world of mobile. To ensure collaboration and cross-functional alignment, we placed this team in a centralized location in Singapore. Around it, we created a smaller team of decision makers whose job was to make sure we were working in alignment with City Asia strategy. We are delighted with how our mobile first approach is playing out. Across the Asia Pacific region, over 30% of our digital transactions now happen on mobile. And today, we have over 7 million customers actively using our digital banking services on mobile, tablet and online. Our biggest priority in the next five years is to offer all our customers seamless banking through their own personal devices. And that means we're going to truly put the bank in their pocket. And that is going to drive everything we do.